Artificial intelligence is rapidly growing across the public sector as agencies work to better understand and harness their data. Today, we spoke with John Hennigan, president of ECS, to learn more about what's driving AI growth and where the technology is being used most effectively. John has been with ECS for over five years, and he's a 2023 WASH 100 award winner. If you enjoyed today's video, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. And if you're interested in being interviewed, please email summer at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is John Hennigan, president of ECS. John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Summer. I'm happy to be here today and look forward to our conversation. So, John, I know ECS is the largest provider of AI ML solutions to the Department of Defense. I'm curious, in which applications are you seeing the highest demand for AI ML, and what's driving that demand? Well, in general, what's driving the demand is our customers want to really transform their missions, meet their business challenges with greater speed and efficiency and, and more precision. You know, as the prime contractor at Maven and supporting AI missions at the, previously the Jake, now CDAO, NGA, the Defense Health Agency, and our, and our Intel community, uh, along with the Army, you know, our solutions are really focused around computer vision and imagery. So think satellite data, uh, satellite imagery or uh, unmanned drone imagery, as well as fixed cameras and other sensors. Um, the, all of those coming together to support our Intel mission. And really we're changing the game in Ukraine uh, with this type of AI capability. So now we are able to get intelligence to an analyst, to someone who can make a decision and move on that intelligence. Uh, what used to take months, we're doing in minutes. Uh, and that really is is helping us have information dominance and changing the game in U the Ukraine conflict, as well as um, with our, our near peer power competition that we're in right now. Um, also, it's supporting uh, the open source intelligence missions that we have. If we look across other mission spaces, uh, we're seeing a demand for that same type of support when we talk about emergency preparedness and response missions. Uh, whether that's a, a pandemic and we're looking at you know predicting you know do we have the right supplies to support where we believe a pandemic is going to happen uh, or you know knowing where um, where we're going to need to support if there's a, a natural disaster like a hurricane or wildfire so there's a lot that goes into ai missions they're using the same capability that we use for defense missions uh, we're also seeing a lot of demand for ai and analytics combined with cyber when it comes to protecting our, uh, our, our nation's most critical assets. We're also using AI a lot in um, IT service management to make that uh, faster and more predictive, a lot of more self-help features. It's also helpful in predictive maintenance for you know, large IT operations or even you know, the equipment that the postal service runs or that are out in airports. So that's really what's driving the demand for AI today. John, as you know, we're seeing a major expansion of AI across the public sector, as evidenced by the growing number of AI offices, leadership, and spending. However, a lot of that spending is going towards R&D, indicating that AI technology is still in the early stages in the federal government. What do you think are some of the key barriers that remain in widespread federal AI adoption, and how do you think we can overcome them? You know, I think the first challenge is really the sheer volume of data that's generated. Uh, we are immersed every day in more and more data. I think I saw a recent estimate that said 2.5 quintillion bytes of data a day. And so in order to handle complex scenarios in which you use AI, you really need to have a whole scaffolding behind it. The right infrastructure, the right data management techniques, uh, model development, and it also requires technology integration with that domain knowledge. You know, ECS will bring a lot of data professionals and AI ML engineers and embed them with the users uh, to eliminate any of the time and resources and the expectations uh, uh, for the, the scenario or mission success. You know, that way we have, you know, AI uh, experts with 
those who are the mission experts and together we're able to solve that, that challenge. I think the second challenge is too often the data that you need to build and train algorithms is siloed in disparate systems and delivered from different vendors. So each of those vendors can have their own set of tables and structures and fields of data. And so to solve this, we look to build multiple data pipelines to get the right data where it needs to be that ensures optimal performance. I think the third challenge is the, the uh, time, labor, intensive workflows and processing of data to really truly provide that actionable intelligence and critical decision makers at an advantage. Uh, again, and this comes back to really embedding engineers with the customers at their sites to ensure the solution is adopted, that you get valuable feedback and you're quickly able to, to integrate advancements to the solution to maximize effectiveness and efficiency. The fourth challenge is the legacy centralized data architectures that are used right now for a lot of AI training and development. You know, we propose and use more of a distributed architecture to data management or a data mesh, which you may have heard uh, about. That really empowers data producers to publish their own data products. Um, and that allows for us to be more agile uh, in the data management, faster in evolving and, in, and um, iterating our AI solutions at a, at a very local level close to the mission. Uh, with a, a data mesh, you're ensuring better data quality and you're allowing for AI development to be so much more mature. And I think the last challenge really is security. You know, with AI, there's a mystery there, there's an explainability challenge, there's distrust. Uh, and, you know, what needs to be there for a successful AI solution is a well articulated, well tested, and proven AI security plan um, that gives your customers confidence that their assets and their missions are secure. John, I want to jump into that cybersecurity conversation. You know, as technical and strategic networks expand, cybersecurity becomes more important and more urgent. Do you think that the United States' cybersecurity efforts are keeping up with demand? And if not, what can we do to catch up? You know, I really do think we are catching up, Summer. So, you know, cybersecurity solutions are lever leveraging analytics and AI to provide automated and predictive threat detection, countermeasure, uh, risk reduction. You know, we're applying data science and applied statistics, machine learning, pattern recognition, and, and visualization techniques um, to truly support that cyber mission. You know, the fusion of automated analytic information is really enhancing our resiliency against that dynamic ever-evolving threat landscape. You know, we've implemented several of these advanced zero trust solutions uh, to really build out capabilities and, and, and enhance the cyber operation programs across government. From a tactical standpoint, we're leveraging advanced cybersecurity, AI, cloud architecture, zero trust architecture to build solutions that are helping the DoD and in Intel community securely share mission data and insight and collaborate with allies and mission partners like never before. And these solutions are having a tremendous impact on today's conflict and beyond. You mentioned earlier the great power competition. I'm curious, which emerging technologies do you anticipate will have the greatest impact on our standing in the great power competition? And where are you seeing those opportunities for meaningful tech growth in the US? Well, clearly, data and AI, for all the reasons I described earlier, really are leading to information dominance, speed to insight, you know, action and change, really, truly transformative change. Um, cybersecurity, aided by AI, is helping us change the game in terms of protecting our nation's most vital assets and really staying in front of an ever-changing threat landscape. If you look further out, I think combining AI and predictive analytics with extended reality immersive 3D, neural interfaces, cognitive automation systems. This is gonna help us tackle mission challenges, including better citizen engagement, therapy for veterans and others, and mission training and preparedness activities. I think also even further out, the advancements in appli and application of quantum computing is another exciting area that's really emerging. We're just starting to investigate that 
and 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 we really believe there are going to be powerful solutions that we to 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 previously unthinkable mission challenges. Um, it will help us modernize our data and cyber challenges as well. So exciting times when we think quantum computing. John, tell me about ECS's growth strategy. Where are you seeing opportunities for expansion and ECS's portfolio, and what new markets or capabilities are you looking at right now? Well, it shouldn't surprise you, we're incredibly focused on data analytics and AI and maintaining our leadership uh, position there, as well as enhanced cybersecurity and zero trust solutions, as, um, as evidenced by our recent acquisition of Ironvine Security. We're also continuing to be focused on turnkey managed enterprise IT solutions that increase the business value to our customers, uh, create cost savings, and really create predictable cost models for our customers. Um, lastly, digital transformation uh, remains a focus. You know, can we compress the time to market of mission enhancing or mission altering, truly transforming capability? In terms of customer markets, ECS has a diverse portfolio across DOD, Intel, Homeland Security, and, and law enforcement, civilian health. But the health mission space is an area we continue to focus on for growth and expansion. We have a lot of work today at Defense Health Agency, VA, and HHS, but those are areas we're really focused on and, and investing more into. Lastly, John, how has the GovCon market changed since you began your career and what's the most impactful trend you're seeing today? Well, I, I had a, a, a lot more and darker hair back when, when I started in the GovCon market. But, you know, the, the speed of change really to me, the speed of action, uh, the speed of which we're changing mission capability really is uh, noticeable in the last 25 years. You know, this uh, embracing of the agile methodology, advancing cloud, uh, and modern software architectures, really leveraging security and fusing that with AI has really helped implement this change. And it continues to be uh, an area where I think we're gonna continue to, to focus on uh, rapidly transforming our government customers' missions. Uh, and it's, it's an exciting time to partner with our federal customers and really advance those important missions of our governments, tackling those big challenges and threats, better serving our citizens, and, and ultimately enabling global freedom, democracy, and, and, and prosperity. So we're excited. Uh, I'm excited. ECS is excited to be a part, of the, a part of the fight. Well, John, thank you so much for your time today and for all the work you do at ECS. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation today, Summer. <music>